This is February 2nd, 2006. We have today for an interview in the oral history collection for UAH, Bob Swinghammer. Thank you, Bob, for being here. I'm Chuck Lundquist. Bob, to start things off, can you tell us a little bit about your career in history, where you spent your youth, where you went to school, and how you got into the space program? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I hope I don't talk too long and run out of space here, but I guess it started a long time ago, about 35, if I remember right. I had a couple of uncles that were flyers and uh, pilots, and <clears throat> back in those days, there used to be a lot of barnstormers that come to the local towns, and this guy flew in with a Ford trimotor. I'll never forget it. And my uncle says, Bob, I'm going to give you a ride in that thing. So we got in that Ford trimotor, and the pilot let me sit in the co-pilot seat. And, oh, man, I was in my seventh heaven. And then one of my other uh, uncles had a... <clears throat> Uh, I guess a T-craft, or it might have been, well, it was a Cub, I believe. Anyway, he flew all the time, so I was always inter interested in uh, in airplanes. And uh, then uh, I grew up in a small town in southern Indiana, went to Purdue University, and after the freshman year, um, you had to go talk to a counselor about where you headed, you know. So I talked to this counselor and I said, I want to be an aeronautical engineer. I like airplanes, always liked airplanes. Oh, he said, my dear fellow, he said, there's no future in that. And I said, how so? This is 1946, see. He says, there's, there are a dime a dozen. And he said, everything in aeronautics has been invented. And he says, that's not the place to go. He says, you're going to have a lot of competition for a job. And I said, well, well, what do you suggest? And he says, um, Electrical engineering is coming on strong. So I said, well, okay. So I went down that route. <laughs> then uh, got out and worked for Sylvania for a while and uh, worked in the development of color television. And I just got antsy. You know, I kept reading about rockets. And I re read an article, I think it was by some lady in Huntsville. And the story was uh, Our Germans. And it was in... Um, Reader's Digest. They told about how the Germans had come over here and how they're working at Redstone and everything. I thought, man, that sounds pretty good. So when vacation time came up, Connie and I left upstate Ohio, dropped our children off with the grandparents in southern Indiana, and we came down. And I said, well, they're launching these things from Florida. Let's go down to Florida. So we went down to... What year was this? Okay, 57. 57, okay. And <clears throat> I got down there, you know, when I'd come from Ohio, and it was always cool up there, and I sat there with a shirt and tie. Nobody had air conditioning in yet. And I was dying. I was flowing. I, I finally just got up and I took the paperwork to the lady. I said, I'm sorry, I can't work here. And she said, why not? I said, I couldn't stand it here. <laughs> so we left there. And then I said, there's one other place I want to go. I believe that German's at, at Huntsville, Alabama. So let's go to Huntsville. So we went to Huntsville. In the meantime, the weather moderated a little bit and it looked a lot better here. Uh, but I talked to the guys in uh, tactical missiles. I didn't know any better. See, I wanted to get with the big ones. <laughs> but so we drove all the way back to Indiana and I had picked up literature here. And I started reading and I said, Connie, I didn't talk to the right people. Turned around the next day and drove all the way back to Huntsville for me. <laughs> <laughs> and took a job. Came to work in October, just about the time Sput Sputnik went up in October 57. Well, it's just been nothing but a great ride ever since then. You know, one thing led to another and worked on the Redstone. Um, I know you had a lot to do with the spin stabilized upper stage, but I was putting the strain gauges on oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> to measure the loads. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And I did that on the, um, we did that on the uh, Juno 2 payloads as well. And we just, just got into a whole host of things. One thing led to another. You know, an interesting thing about that was that people were, ne they didn't categorize you. They didn't put you in a cubbyhole. If you had an idea, somebody might say, well, you, you can't work on that. You're an electrical engineer. Nobody bothered you. If, if it looked like it was a good idea, you got the support. And everybody was that way. It was just a, just a fantastic climate. 
What organization did you go into then when you came? Well, I started off in manufacturing engineering, but I had an instrumentation unit. I did all their diagnostics and instrumentation in the manufacturing. Um, they were having some problems, spot welding parts for the redstone, and I worked on that, and we put some diagnostics on the spot welders, improved that uh, process. Um, and we did a number of things in, in that general area. And I stayed there for a while, and then uh, they got, we got into other things. We got into, um, of course, we got into the Saturn I. Uh, we had some interesting problems there as well. I remember, you know, the Saturn I had the Jupiter center core with the red stones clustered, hung from a cruciform. They had two big bolts in each red stone tank up there. They had a terrible time they torquing those bolts. They didn't want to get them too tight, but they couldn't leave them too loose. And so in my instrumentation unit, I had a watchmaker from Coleman. And I said, Mac, if I drill a hole down in one of these bolts, can you put a, a strain gauge down at the bottom for me? He said, oh, I think I can. So we took those big bolts and drilled a hole down in there. And he, he got his jeweler's loop on and he put that strain gauge down at the bottom. So. We did that on all those bolts, and then all you just had to do is sit there and watch the meter, and you'd keep torquing it until you got the right value, and you quit. And then we finally got a company to build those things, and they called it Strain Cert, and they made millions of bucks, and they're still <laughs> selling them. <too. laughs> well, you missed your chance to be a wealthy man. <laughs> oh, I'm, I wouldn't have traded. I still wouldn't have. I don't think I went down the wrong path. No, I just one thing led to another. You yeah, know. well, you went through a whole list of positions at uh, first the Army and then mm -hmm. uh, Marshall. Can you sort of summarize how that went? Well, Or do you remember it? <laughs> well, I guess I do. Um, yeah, we were Army Ballistic Missile Agency until 60, and then we became NASA. Um, and then, um, let's see, I was trying to remember I think I stayed with the manufacturing engineering group till I went to MIT for my master's degree. Oh, and that what was year was that? 67. And, uh, but I had been uh, fooling around with some unusual things. Like, like I said, nobody stopped you if they thought you had a good idea. And I had been working on magnetomotive forming. I used uh, intense transient magnetic fields three or four millisecond pulse, three or four hundred thousand amperes. I remember hearing about that. And we were moving metal around like gangbusters. <laughs> I had a plasma physicist friend, Ralph Waniak in California, who was working for our Atomic Energy Commission, and, and, and he helped me a lot. And, and I kept saying, and he says, we, I have a terrible time keeping my coils from exploding. And I said, and he said, it moves metal. And I said, aha, that's what we need to do is move metal. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, on the Saturn, for instance, the first stage, the S1C stage, those big suction lines for the locks were 25 inches in diameter, and they couldn't spin them to that tolerance. Nobody could manufacture them. So we designed, I designed a coil that if it was too large, the coil fit over the outside, and I pulsed it a few times with four or 500,000 amps and squeezed it down. <laughs> if it was not big enough, made one on a mandrel and stuck it inside and shot it a few times and stretched it. And all the first suction lines were, were made that way at the Marshall Space Flight Center. That The guys in private industry finally got so they could build them, but it took about eight or ten months before they could come up to speed with that. You know, we always prided ourselves on anticipating what the next move ought to be. And the uh, same thing was true with thermal protection materials. You know, up until, like on Redstone, Jupiter, all that thermal protection material was applied by hand. It usually was cork and glued on, so to speak. And then uh, we kept saying, We've got to do better than that if we're going to make these big ones. You can't do everything by hand. So we came up with uh, the thermal protection materials that would meet the criteria, that would stand the exposure to a hard vacuum. Uh, and then we developed the automotive techniques. And I guess we were some of the earliest users of robots in, in manufacturing. We used robots then to apply these thermal protective systems. Did that on Saturn and uh, 
and then also again on the space shuttle. And along the way, some good things came out. Um, Dr. Lucas and his team before me had collected a lot of data on stress corrosion cracking. In the early days, that was a big problem. You'd get a launch vehicle sitting on a pad and people would inspect it and also they'd see cracks forming. And every day the cracks got bigger and worse. So that was a real problem. So we got the guys together and we finally drafted a specification and did a lot of testing of various materials and then we rank ordered rank ordered them according to their propensity. And we gave these charts, these rank order charts to the designers that we we'll use that one, that's a bad one, use this one. And so that worked out very well. Um, and then of course on the big Saturn one of uh, Saturn V, the S one C stage, that thing was so big, you know, most of the time we welded rotating the segment in the horizontal. And that one we had it weld in a vertical. <laughs> I remember one time we were trying to weld it in a tower at the Marshall Space Flight Center. You had to put stack the segments one on the other. We were down for six weeks. We couldn't weld. We had arc wander. You'd start to weld on the seam and mm, it'd take off and go someplace else, you know. So I went out there and looked at that and I thought, I don't understand this. That shouldn't be the case. And then I noticed that there is a ground return when you weld. It goes back to the power supply. And this one was located over on the edge of the tank, and as it rotated, it changed the distance uh, of the return path. Aha, uh, uh, I believe I know. So back in those days, you know, you could get by with anything. I took it back of the envelope and sketched up and went over in the shop. The guy made it for me. Three hours I had it. It was a cylindrical device. The tank had a hole in the center and exit. And this circular thing fit right in that hole, and I brought the ground return right up to the center. Uh -huh. That stopped it. We welded them all after that and had no problem anymore. Just one thing after the other came up. You never know which direction you were going to head. But the beauty of it all was, like I said, there was nobody hanging over your shoulder and said, no, you can't do that. That's not in your discipline. It just didn't, it didn't exist, you know. <laughs> They, you know, they, they even let us do some dumb things that didn't work sometimes, but on balance, I think, we, we got a lot of good out of that, that prevailing attitude to do things that way. And um, then, of course, we developed that whole series of magnetomotive tools and gave those to the contractors. They used them at the Michoud plant. They used them on the West Coast on the S2 stage, and, um, and they ended up being picked up and used by... Uh, hydrofoil people ship and shipbuilding and so on. They were they turned out to be very useful besides just just for for our purposes. Now, well, while you were for a long while I guess you were in the materials labs. So yep. Can yep, you was, comment some on that? That was there twenty years. <laughs> Boy it was twenty good years too, I tell you. Of course uh, you know, guys like Dr. Lucas left a hard mark to shoot at. You know, that, that was tough to keep up with a guy like that. So, uh, but but I think we did pretty well, and uh, and uh, we were, of course, like I always told everybody, he says, well, "What what what are you doing in materials?" And I said, "Well, everything's made out of something, <laughs> and and every project, you know, you got into material problems." And uh, and I said, "It's challenging, you know. One day it's one thing, the next day it's the next." But we uh, we developed some new alloys then too. Uh, we really perfected the. Uh, the 2195 aluminum lithium, very strong and very light. But when we we tried to use it, we couldn't use it. It was stress corrosion cracking sensitive, um, and you just it wasn't suitable. So we tweaked the alloy composition, and we finally got it to where you could use it. So we we built the shuttle external tanks out of that and saved 7,000 pounds in the process. Also developed some new materials, uh, mass alloy 25, better than the existing in canal alloy, not susceptible to hydrogen. And um, I remember one interesting thing. <laughs> we always tried to anticipate. I kept telling the guys, you know, I'd read magazines and technical, and I'd send a note along, look into this, this looks like something good. And they all got in the habit, and then they did it themselves. 
and uh, and that's what it takes. So I saw this ad one time about somebody's making ceramic balls for ball bearings, and I thought, ah. Oh. One of the big problems we always had with the space shuttle main engines was ball bearings. You know, sometimes we could only fly once and we'd have to change the bearings on. So I told the guy in, uh, in lubrication and physics to let's start something going in, in, in these ceramic bearings. So he did, and he had, we were going pretty good, and, and they really looked great, you know. Trouble was, we had to get them from Japan. Oh, that galled me. We had to go to Japan to get those ceramic bearings. And I called a couple of the bearing manufacturers in the United States and I said, hey, you guys are missing the boat. You, I said, we're using this bearing steel and it's just not holding up. And I said, but we're using some of these bearings from Japan that are ceramic. And I said, we've tested them extensively. And the guy says, ah, forget about it. He says, if our bearings don't do your job, you're mistreating our bearings. That was his answer. <laughs> he wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. So you know what it ended up? We finally developed a formulation that was fine for our turbo pumps, and we were trying to sell an alternate turbo pump development that, that had less potential failure this points. This was a metal ball bearing then? Yeah, it was metal then. And so uh, we, we tweaked this composition with the manufacturer in Japan, and the irony of it was, they wouldn't touch it in the United States, so I had to go to, of all places, Schweinfurt, Germany. Remember that in yeah. World War II? Yeah. That was a big ball bearing factory, yeah. Yeah. and we bombed it and won the war. But anyway, <laughs> I thought it was ironic we ended up going back. We rebuilt it. <laughs> yeah. And we took these Japanese balls to Schweinfurt, Germany, and they made ceramic ball bearings for us. And I'm telling you what, they ran like gangbusters. And the interesting thing was that um, I don't know how much, I don't want to tell you how much we had spent. I don't think I don't even know how much we had spent to, to develop the alternate turbo pump that was safer and more reliable. And they gave us three months out of Washington to fix it, or otherwise they canceled the program. And we were millions into the program by then. It would have been a crime. And so I told Jack Lee, we got these ceramic <laughs> ball bearings, and I said, I, I know they'll work. We've tested them under, under simulated engine runs, under heavy loads, and they're really good. And he says, you're going to put those glass balls in there? I said, no, 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 ceramic, not glass. <laughs> so we took one, took one up to him, laid it on a piece of steel, and hit it with a hammer, <laughs> and it dented the hammer. So I said, see? <laughs> no problem. So we switched to him, oh, and you know, he had to write a letter demanding that the contractor use these in the turbo machinery. They wouldn't do it. And after they did it, they liked it so much they started putting them in their aircraft engines. So that was one of the things that really worked out swell. Those bearings were just, just remarkable. It was a dream. As we went through the archives earlier this morning, you were interested in the Skylab collection and okay. reminisced on the yeah. materials problems that went with it. Yeah. Well, it was 12 days and nights is what I'll never forget. <laughs> I stayed in the office. I ate in the office. I didn't shave. Sometimes I'd go home in the middle of the day and get a shower and a shave, but most of the time... Of course, what we had... We lost the micrometeoroid shield on liftoff, and that... You want, you want to say a few words about why and how that happened? <laughs> Oh, I hate to talk about that. Well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Somebody miscalculated the the orifice, the venting orifice, and, and the pressure buildup behind. Those things happen. I mean, certainly wasn't intentional. But anyway, off went the micrometeoroid shield, and now it's getting hot up there. And uh, we had a little competition with our sister center down in Texas, and uh, they came up with a parasol. We already had a vent for the Apollo telescope mount, or for a camera. And so they stuck this parasol out through the vent and expanded it. The only thing was, <laughs> they used the uh, ripstop nylon material. And I said, man, I've run a lot of tests on that stuff. Ultraviolet eats it up, you know. So I ran some more tests. At, I had an exposure device, and I ran it at 10 suns, so you get the results 10 times sooner. And yeah, it looked like in about a week it's going to start coming apart. Sure enough, it did. 
And so we didn't wait while we were running those 10 sun tests. We started to develop, we called it a sail because it looked like a sail. We took a big piece of that ribstock nylon and we had developed a thermal control material called S13G. It's white, had the right alpha over epsilon, epsilon activity over him. It's just fine. Sprayed it on top of that thing. And then we got some sealed parachute packers and they packed that sucker all up and got it down into a relatively small package. Oh, and of course, before that, we couldn't, we didn't know how to sew it. It was so big, I mean, it was huge. <laughs> So we got these little seamstresses from some company in New Jersey and, and paid their way down and paid their salaries and they sat, <laughs> sat down in the materials and sewed that seal up. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just wherever you can get, whatever you can get, you know, to get it done. So, well, then <clears throat> I think Kerwin and Weiss deployed that thing on Skylab, if I remember right. Uh, and it worked just fine. The temperature came down. It, it wouldn't have been possible to stay in there much longer. <clears throat> Temperatures were getting well over 100. I think at one point it was 130 Fahrenheit. You just couldn't stay in there. So that saved the Skylab. <clears throat> but we were up 12 days and nights fixing that thing, getting it ready to fly out there. And my dad just made a big mistake and decided to visit us <clears throat> during that period of time. I got to see him about a half hour one day, <laughs> and he had to go back. He says, what are you doing? He says, is it just you? I said, everybody is doing that out there. He, and he is a superintendent in the chair factory, you know. And he said, well, I couldn't get him to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we went home after a 30-minute <laughs> visit. Of course, he met with the children and my wife. But yeah. <clears throat> it was hectic. But we got her done. <laughs> Well, later you moved into some management roles at Marshall, can you? Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. Tell us a word about that. Well, <clears throat> I was happy where I was. I was, you know, I was like a whole It was a three ring thing. circus, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I ring got, master of a three ring circus. Exactly. <laughs> but I got moved up stairs, and uh, it turned out not to. As a matter of fact, maybe that was the nicest job of all. Um, one of the guys. Uh, tried to characterize that job, and he says, "He says you're a technical gadfly." <laughs> yeah. What was what was the title of the job? Uh, associate director for the Marshall Center for Technical. It's kind of like being a chief engineer, I guess. And so I got into a lot of things, and I, I got especially heavy into failure investigation at that point. Um, I had done a lot of failure investigations, and I enjoyed that. And, and I found something when I was at MIT that proved invaluable. There was a paper some guy published, and it was called uh, uh, Business Trees for Business Decisions. And, you know, that was where you start at the top with the problem, and then you branch it out. Yeah. And so I looked at that, and I thought, well, that, that'll work if you're looking for failure analysis. And so I brought that back to Marshall Center. That was in 68. Then we used it. We had two major accidents at Utah in the solids, and I used it in both cases there. And then uh, one of the big, the big one uses that Bob Milton and I were together went on. Uh, they had the fleet grounded in 1990, hydrogen leak. Couldn't find it, and it was grounded for six months. Nothing could fly until we found out where is this hydrogen leak? Did they all have it, or is it just? So <laughs> we went down there in September, <clears throat> and I guess we came home at late November or early December, but we found it. We constructed a fall tree, and uh, it literally took months to wade through all the possibilities. See, and project managers typically don't like it because it's tedious. You have to just wade through everything. You don't always need a fall tree because sometimes it's pretty obvious if the wheel fell off and the busted bolts there, you only had fault yeah. for that. But this thing had been going on for six months and, and it was a lot of little leaks plus one big one. We found them all and she flew what, I think the first or second week in December. Where was the big one? Where was, well, the big one was a valve that a guy had to assemble but he couldn't see it, he had to do it by feel. 
and it, that didn't work. That didn't work. <laughs> that I was can, the biggest thing. I can believe that. But that was Columbia, and when we got finished, she was the tightest bird in the in, in the fleet. You know, I mean, that sucker was good. After it was all over, it was nice. But when we were there, you know, Bob and I kept worrying. I, you know, I'd lay it awake at night at, at, at in the motel because. What had happened earlier, they had started to move an arbiter, and some technicians had not removed all the apparatus, auxiliary apparatus inside, and it rattled around in the boat tail. <clears throat> so they gave those guys a seven-day uh, vacation unpaid. They didn't farm, but they gave them a vacation unpaid. And I kept thinking, oh, my goodness. What if one of those guys is cracking that valve a little bit, you know, tightening it up when it should be tight and loosening it when we're checking it? I thought it could be sabotage. So <laughs> we started spending some time on Sundays, you know. On Sundays, I'd go out there and hobnob with those guys on the pad and crawl around in the aft and everything. And I finally, after talking to all six or seven of them, I decided these guys are not of a temperament to be vindictive. So it's not that. It really is something. And of course, we kept plodding away with the, with the fall tree approach all the time. We, we, finally, we finally got her fixed. <laughs> but then there were some things about the job. And, and I got into a lot of failure investigations subsequent to that. Uh, we worked on a tether. Uh, I think somebody from, I'm trying to remember, somebody from the West Coast headed the failure investigation, but we headed it here at, at Marshall. And when we had that teller failure, we spent about, I don't know, two or three months on that one. The, f the first or the second failure? <laughs> I guess it was the... Uh, the one with the bolt or the one with the arcing? one with the arcing. Yeah, and that, that got off on two <laughs> passions, law, and a few other things, you yeah, know. <laughs> yeah. it, it wasn't just one simple thing. It got it, I, I know, you know... And I asked the guys that designed it, I said, did you guys ever hear of Passion's Law? <laughs> <laughs> and they jumped to the wrong conclusion. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has to do with voltage breakdown and electro distance and spacing and, and pressure. So anyway, we, we figured out what, what did it. But uh, got into all kinds of things like that. But one of the last things I did... <laughs> I really didn't want to do. I enjoyed mucking around in all this technical stuff, you know, but one day the center director came to me and he said, you know, the pressure's really getting strong. There's a new method of operating called ISO 9000. And he said all the big companies are switching to it and it's supposed to be the right thing to do. And the administrator has given us our marching orders. We will do it. He says, I'd like for you to do that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I said, I'm just a technical plumber type. I don't, you know, I <laughs> know anything about that. So anyway, we cranked up and we got going. And I have to say, in retrospect, I got to meet a lot more people, people that I didn't know at the center before. And we got them all working together, and they were a, really a good bunch. And I guess in retrospect, I'd have to say, it was valuable for me. I actually enjoyed it. But boy, when he dumped that on me, I thought, oh, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> but you can't have fun all the time, I guess. But we did a lot of things, and, and like I said, it's just a, it was a wonderful ride, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, the space station was underway before you retired, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we had involvement in the space station, uh, particularly with regard to uh, spurious outgassing and stuff and materials that were liable to mess up experiments and that sort of thing. Uh, also got involved to some extent with the design of the windows. Uh, there was a problem and in, in the beginning and people were worried about the windows fracturing. So we did some work in the fracture mechanics area to make sure we, gonna ha we weren't going to have windows uh, that fractured. And then there we did a lot of testing with respect to leak rates in the space station. How much could you tolerate? How much would you like be likely to get from the seals that were designed into the system? And that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, if you're in materials, you're into everything. <laughs> and 
we did a lot of that kind of work relative to assuring that the space station was going to have its long life and, and not have exorbitant leak rates and not outgas and ruin people's experiments and that sort of stuff. So we were heavily engaged in that as well. I'm sure you had lots of interaction with the various astronauts. Any oh, interesting yeah. thoughts there? Yeah, I can tell you one that scared the devil out of me. We, I started scuba diving and and had gone to the Keys a lot and everything. And always impressed me that if you ballasted yourself correctly, you're just neutral, you know. And I thought, I simulate gravity like this. So we had a tank I had been doing some laser experiments in, and we put water in it and. We got a scuba outfit. Yeah, this looks good. So uh, we decided we were going to try to uh, convince the astronauts and others that that would be a good simulation of weightlessness. So during the Skylab days, I got to be a pretty good friend with Alan Bean, astronaut Alan Bean. And so I called him one day and I said, we got this idea about simulating weightlessness. And Houston didn't have anything like this yet. And I said, why don't you fly up here on a T-38 and we'll take a look and uh, see what you think about it. So we got him up here. And of course, I had tried to get some suits from, from, from Houston and we couldn't have them because we weren't in the astronaut business. Well, I can understand that. So. I got some out of Mare Island Navy Base, but they were the old pressure suits that pilots used to fly at high altitude. They had the corrugations on the arms and, you know, the old, old suits. <laughs> and they were already obsolete when we got them, so, but we were using them. And so we put Al Bean in one of these old, I think it was a Mark IV suit. And we had this big tank, it was about 25 feet deep and about 30 feet across. And we were trying to simulate what would be required to change an S-4B stage into a habitable Skylab. Remember when we yep. had the yeah. wet workshop and the right. dry yes, workshop? I remember that. Yeah. So one of the things you would have to do to convert that tank in orbit would be to take this plate off the, off the bulkhead. It had about 82 bolts in it. So we devised a tool that contra-rotated so it didn't torque the astronaut around when he used it. And Bean takes his tool and he goes down and goes across the bottom of the tank and he starts taking bolts out. And so I told the guys, I want to be one of the safety divers. I just don't want anything to happen to this astronaut. So I was right above him, floating above him, watching him take these bolts out. All of a sudden, I heard boom underwater like this. Under his left armpit, there's a hole about the size of a silver dollar. Oh and I thought, oh my God, we're going to kill an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> so I surfaced and I told a guy on the console, I said, John, raise the pressure. He said, what do you mean? I said, we got a big leak down here. Give us all the air you got. <laughs> so he increased the pressure. But Bean was a sharp cookie. He put his hand over like that and clamped down with his left arm. Laid his tool down, walked across the bottom tank, climbed up, and got out. <laughs> That's all there was to it. Cool cat. He yeah. never said anything to anybody. I said, hey, well, don't tell anybody. It will be the end of us here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. We had some good times, though. He's a good guy. In fact, I, I just had an uh, uh, invitation to attend an art showing. You know, he's an internationally acclaimed artist. Is that he's right? like, oh, yeah. He's the number one space artist in the world, I'd say. So I got a notice in the mail from him, and he said, I'm going to be in, in um, Youngstown, Ohio. There is a museum called a Museum of American Art or something, or maybe a space art. I'm not sure. And he says, I'd like you to, have, to be my guest. So I said, well, we'll go over and visit our daughter in South Carolina and drive up there. I went over in South Carolina, got sick, and I had to come home. Couldn't go. Oh, that's <laughs> so I missed it. But he's a great guy. He's just a rare individual. Really great. Well, you retired a few years ago from Marshall. When was that? 1999, in January. Yeah, I had, what, 42 years, I guess? 41? Yeah. 
Yeah. Any regrets on retiring? Uh, yes and no. I've, they've called me back on a lot of consulting. After, after Columbia, I went back and spent about six months full time. And, and I was out a couple of weeks ago on a problem on the engine. They call me in and out. And, uh, and that's kind of nice to go back and see all the people you know. But <laughs> more and more, it, it's coming out that you don't know too many of them anymore. <laughs> Everybody that you used to know is gone, you know. So I really, I really enjoyed a little bit of consulting on the side like that. And I think there's a time for the young ones to take over. And, and it's their time right now. They got a new mission. They can design a uh, crude launch vehicle and a cargo launch vehicle. And, it, you know, it looks as good to me now as it did back in the Saturn V days. I think they have the kind of challenges and opportunities now that, that we had. There. So you're optimistic about the future? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I wasn't a year ago. It looked at like things were drifting to me, but it looks like, and I, of course, you know, you have a great administrator now. I know him personally. That guy's good. If, if anybody can do it, he can do it. Where, where did you run into him? Well, he was a chief engineer for a while, and when I was a, uh, associate director technical, I had a lot of interfacing. Every time he came to visit Marshall, I interfaced with him, and uh, I, I just think he's a great guy. What project was he on, chief engineer? He was uh, NASA chief engineer. Oh, NASA chief engineer. Yeah, okay, that was his capacity was. then. Yeah. Yeah. And he's done a lot of things and been a lot of places, but... Yeah. Uh, I really got a, a lot of regard, high regard for him. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add to while you've got a chance to reminisce? And uh, Well, there's something I wanted to say, and I was afraid I'd forget it. And I've been noted for three by five cards, so I'm going to say it. All right, go ahead. You know, the Marshall Center always reminded me of Caesar's model, Julius Caesar's model. Uh, Dates Fortuna. Juvat et on detans. Fortune favors the bold and the daring. And you know, <laughs> if you'll allow me a vulgar idiom, we all had a lot of guts back then. You know, <laughs> Didn't we though? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bob. We appreciate your, your coming. And My pleasure. If you don't have anything more to add, we'll call it an end. Thank, thank you. Thank you.